Thank you, uh, Matt, and thanks everyone for coming. Great to see uh, so many people here today in Sydney. <clears throat> so bulls charging or bears awakening is sort of the theme for this, uh, this luncheon today. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about uh, diversifying risk in any environment. But in terms of that specific topic of uh, are we in a bull or bear market, I think the bears are actually still snoring, so to speak. I think we're still a little way away from a big uh, bear market. And uh, the reason I, I say that is because uh, post-World War II, every major bear market has been preceded by one thing, and that is an inverse yield curve in the US. Or put it the other way, the simple thing is that short rates are actually higher than long bond yields. Um, and on this chart here, which has got Australia and the US, the US is in red, um, short rates in the US are 1.9%, bond, higher long bond yields, 10 year yields, just under 3%. So we're probably about 1.5% of tightening away, um, assuming bond yields don't go anywhere, uh, from an inverse yield curve. And indeed, I expect bond yields to move up towards 4%. So actually, we've probably got quite a few more tightening before we have an inverse yield curve and short rates are higher than long rates. So I think we're a way away from a major bear market. We can still have a correction, but I don't think we're going to see, you know, we haven't got the next uh, GFC around the horizon. Um, another thing to take from this chart is that uh, we've actually got the lo current long bond yield, the current cash rate, but we've also got the expectations of markets for cash rates over the next five years. And actually, it's a pretty gentle tightening cycle, both here and in the US. And also, uh, you can see there that, uh, which is quite different to this time last year, US interest rates are actually now higher than Australian interest rates. Um, I don't want to worry you, but the last time that happened, uh, the Australian dollar was at 50 cents. Um, but anyway, I don't believe that we're in a, uh, a bear market. However, for income investors, some of you or some of your clients, might actually think you're already in a bear market because uh, if they have Telstra in their portfolio, which is the uh, bellwether, one of the bellwether income stocks in Australia, you know that it's actually down about 50% in price over the last 18 months. And in fact, it's not just Telstra, but basically five of the biggest stocks in Australia that make up nearly half of all the income of the whole market. And this is how concentrated the Australian market is, but four banks, Telstra and one other, actually make up half of all the dividend income of the whole Australian market. Uh, and five of those stocks have been pretty much in the dog house for the last 18 months. Telstra, as I said, down 50%. We know NBN, competition, et cetera, the dividends cut 30%. I believe it'll be cut 50% uh, within a year or two, and which would actually reflect a 50% decline in share price. Um, but the banks haven't been all that great either, as you're probably aware. They're actually down about 10% over the last 18 months. Would have, could have been a lot worse. They were down 15 to nearly 20% only about a month ago. But I think some of the value managers, and we thought they were looking pretty cheap, have actually uh, pushed them up in the last month or so. They're still down 10% in a market that's up about 10%. So actually, collectively, those five stocks, you had an equally weighted portfolio of four banks and Telstra. Um, your capital values are down about nearly 20% over the last 18 months versus a market that's up, uh, it's actually up 9% in capital terms. It's about a, nearly 30% underperformance. But uh, think of this, if you took the four banks and Telstra out of our index, their performance out of our index over the last 18 months, they have actually underperformed the rest of the index by 40% over the last 18 months in capital terms. I haven't included, so this is just in price terms, but 40% is a huge underperformance, so, so you can think you're already in a bear market. Now, I said, we know the reasons for Telstra. For the reasons for the banks are pretty obvious as well. We had a bank levy 15 months ago, and we have a current Royal Commission with superannuation, uh, the next cab off the rank, which might be somewhat interesting, hopefully not too interesting. Um, but the other bit of regulation on the horizon, obviously we don't know the outcome of the Royal Commission, so that's going to weigh on the banks and financial services. But the other one that's uh, the elephant in the room, uh, I think, is uh, the ALP and their franking credit policy. Uh, you know, the ALP is threatening to, threatening to uh, as I call it, rob granny in the name of Paul. Paul, of course, being Paul Keating. And we've done some work on this. We've written one paper. We've actually got another paper just about out, and this is one of the, uh, the slides from it, one of the analysis of it. We've done some analysis of a typical superannuation or a superannuation fund. It doesn't have to be self-managed super. This can be a retail fund, an industry fund, or a self-managed super fund. On this slide, we have varied the amount of money that is in pension phase 
from zero to 100%. And clearly, um, if you're at the, the right-hand side there, if you're in a 100% pension phase superannuation fund and the ALP get their policy through, their proposal through to stop the refunding of franken credits, so you're a tax-exempt fund, you're never going to see the value of your franken credits. You're going to lose all that value. And for a $1 million, uh, a mum and dad with a $1 million in their self-managed super fund in pension phase, they're going to lose something somewhere between five dollars and $10,000 a year on our calculations. Um, they could lose more if they have a, uh, an overexposure to Australian shares, but probably five dollars to $10,000 a year or $100 to $200 a week by losing those franking. So it's a pretty important, that's a fair bit of money for someone who's a self-funded retiree. So this is quite uh, negative for self-managed super, but it's not just self-managed super. This will actually affect any superannuation fund on our calculations. Somewhere between 50 and 70% of your, of your superannuation fund is in pension phase. You run the risk of losing some franking. And if you're 100% pension, you'll, use it, you'll lose it all because you get no refunds. Um, on the other hand, on the other extreme, um, if you're a young fund with very few pension members, and Australian Super have already put their hand up and said, um, we are going to give the full refund of franking to all our members, including our pension members. Why? Because nearly 100% of their members are actually in accumulation phase and they pay tax, and so they can do the credits between and within the fund. So they're going to be OK. But I've heard on the grapevine that at least one or two retail funds are actually in that 50 to 70 to, to, to higher percent of pension and are in danger because they already are in a net franking credit refund position that they may actually start losing franking credits. So if this proposal comes into uh, being, as a financial advisor, you may have to go to your retail rep and say, will you be able to refund all the franking for my, my investors? You're going to have to ask that. You're going to have to see whether your app can do it. Um, and it may be, uh, if it comes in, that you might have to think about where you actually put your client's money. Um, another table here shows if you're in a super fund that pays tax like Australian super, they will be able to fully refund franking credits for people who have up to 1.6 million in pension. Um, uh, but if you're in a self-managed super fund, you won't be able to refund any franking credits at all if your members retire uh, this year which is after the cutoff date. There was a cutoff date for some pensioners. Um, there'll be some super funds, so potentially retail funds, that you'll get a partial refund of franking. It may actually be for people who, uh, depending on the assets test, where they sit. So there's an individual with, say, $500,000 in a self-managed super fund, if this proposal comes in, would actually be better off collapsing their self-managed super fund and either owning their shares in their own name, because they'd, they'd be a pensioner and get a full refund of franking credits under the exemption, or actually potentially going to the likes of Australian Super and getting the full refund of franken credits. Um, so it's quite discriminatory there, and, and it does seem to favour certain funds over others, and it certainly seems to me to be discriminatory against self-managed super funds. Um, but don't panic yet. Um, this is a proposal by the opposition. Uh, the latest polls suggest that it may not be as easy as they thought a month or two back about whether they'd win the election. Some people argued when they put this proposal up, actually they were shooting themselves in the foot because they're not going to win the grey vote. Um, but even if they get elected, uh, the ALP need to get it through Senate, and I don't believe it's going to be the easiest thing to get this through the Senate. Um, and we are going to send a message to the politicians. Uh, we have a petition on our website. I would encourage everyone in this room, if you believe in what I say, if you believe your clients value franking credits, I'd suggest get on our website sign up on our petition, get your clients to do it, get your colleagues to do it. Let's send a message to Canberra, because people power is how it works, that stop meddling with franking and you know, don't rob granny in the name of Paul. So that is all the bad news. Uh, you know, the potential regulation in Australia is certainly impacting our market and certainly the financial services sector that we're in, although Pinnacle's share price seems to be doing okay today. Um, I'm now gonna talk to you about how you can reduce those risks and actually, it's a very, very simple message, and we've used this chart before, but I know there's a lot of new people in this audience. Now, Australia is very concentrated. Six stocks, half the income. But if you look at uh, global equities, the top six stocks represent basically bugger all of the income of the MSCI world, ex-Australia. And if you look at the names there, you might not be able to see them, but there are the likes. Even, uh, you wouldn't think they pay that much income, but the likes of Apple and Microsoft actually are in the top six income producers globally. 
and there's only one bank, it's HSBC. Um, so you actually have a very diversified mix, even than that six names, certainly a hell of a lot uh, better mix than four banks and Telstra in our, in our own top six in terms of income. Um, and you don't really have to com compromise the levels of income uh, all that much but, uh, to, to get that diversification, but uh, I'll also show you this, this slide here, which shows you that mathematically, um, you know, the previous slide was just a, a number of stocks, but mathematically you could actually uh, get good diversification or good risk reduction by uh, adding global shares to an all-Australian portfolio. Um, going from that all Australian portfolio in the bottom uh, right hand corner, um, every time you add some global equities to your portfolio you're reducing risk initially, but in the last five years you've actually significantly increased returns, um, and as I uh, mentioned you can do that without necessarily compromising income, because there is plenty of income in global shares even though the index doesn't generate a lot. Um, for an example, Yes, Telstra gives you good income, but the, the capital has been rubbish over the last 12 months, but uh, 18 months. But if you look at global telcos, um, they've performed much better than Telstra has. You know, they've actually kept it, retained their values. So the, the Telstra issue, the Telstra sell-off, is not a telco issue. It's not a global telco issue. It is a Telstra, Australian Telstra NBN issue. It's an Australian Telstra, you know, TPG increased competition in mobiles issue. It is not a global issue. And um, there is actually some pretty good income in some of those global stocks. So the likes of AT&T and Swisscom, you can get 5 to 6% income. And for those of you who know how we generate 6% uh, income out of global or 9% income out of Australian shares, we rotate stocks to actively generate more income. So we can actually pick up the dividends of AT&T, AT Swisscom and Singtel by moving between those stocks and pick up uh, the dividends as they go X. Um, and even income in IT. So uh, no income in Facebook, it doesn't pay a dividend, not the greatest P28, looks a little bit expensive from our point of view, but we are an income investor. But Seagate, which is pretty much in everybody's computer's disk drive, um, priced on a PE of 14, uh, even after rallying 50% in the last 12 months, but it's actually on a dividend yield of 4.4%, which is pretty good for a you know, sort of growthy uh, IT stock, and it's grown that dividend 22% per, uh, over the last three years. So we find that to be a, a pretty attractive stock. So you don't have to compromise income by buying, going globally, but you need to have a manager that looks for income um, because the yield of the global equities is only about 2%. So that's how we've been able to generate about 6% dividend yield after fees, and it's real income, real dividend yield after fees out of our global uh, shares income fund, uh, and actually got very competitive performance versus other global income players. So that's uh, all I wanted to talk to you uh, today about, uh, the important disclaimer.